Uh, hello, everyone. So Bernardo and I will be talking about um, uh, hacking bootloaders and creating a bootkit. And our talk is called I Boot When You Boot. So yeah, I get you get the pun. Um, so we first will begin with the introduction and what we do, who we are. Then we're going to talk about malware that already exists that runs on embedded devices. Then we're going to see how an embedded device boots. And then we're going to have a look at gaining persistence on embedded devices. And then we're going to talk about writing a bootkit and then how you can detect the bootkit and how you can mitigate risks that are involved here. So my name is Vincent. I work at the KPN Red Team. Uh, I'm a moderator for Neil Amsterdam. So you know, if you want to talk someday, just uh, let us know. I think Bipin is around here as well. It's right there. You can you know, ping us, send some slides, and you can do a talk. Uh, I like Linux. I like low-level stuff. And since we're giving a talk about bootkits, I might not go to the US anytime soon. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I live in Amsterdam. So my name is Bernardo. Uh, I'm Brazilian. I'm also working at the KPN Red Team. I play CTF with the Goonies. The, it's a Brazilian CTF team. And I'm very good at breaking routers. So <laughs> let's start. So malware uh, targeting embedded devices. Spoiler alert, this is not something new. So there are like lots of malware already targeting embedded devices. So the CIA uh, cherry blossom uh, on the leaked documents from WikiLeaks they all describe it how they are creating backdoor firmwares and that we can like flash on home routers. But there's also uh, known botnets like Mirai, so targeting uh, embedded devices using weak passwords. But also, you know, Flasher.a, <coughs> which was uh, basically a DDWRT modified firmware. So there are like lots of kinds of um, malware targeting embedded devices. Some of them don't care about persistence. For example, Mirai. Mirai is just in like infecting a device and just start scanning the internet. And some, some like uh, malware, like the CIA, the one from CIA, is like the Flasher.a. They have like some kind of persistence, but they don't care about the bootloader. They just like uh, flashing a new firmware. So, so yeah, boot process of an embedded device is like slightly different of your everyday x86 device. Um, so the the NUNT or the NOR in this case, the NOR flash is hard coded inside the CPU boot code. So the moment you turn on the CPU, it boots to the flash, and on the flash it like goes to the bootloader. The bootloader initializes the hardware, and then it like jumps to the firmware that's gonna decompress the LZMA because the kernel is usually compressed because it saves space. So it like uh, un LZMA's the kernel into RAM, and then it you know jumps to the jumps to the un uh, jumps to the first instruction of the kernel. And then from there on, the kernel mounts the file system and then kicks off in it. And there you go, your embedded device is booted. And you can see the typical boot process over there. Bootloader firmware on LZMA into ROM, and then you're basically done. So uh, persistence, why having a persistence at a bootloader level, why is it interesting? It's because when you uh, have like a firmware upgrade, you know, you, don't, you go to the D-Link website, you download the firmware. When you flash your firmware, it's not changing the bootloader partition. It's just changing like the firmware and all the other partitions, but it doesn't care about bootloaders because reflashing bootloaders is a sensitive operation. If you do something wrong, you, you break your device and you need like to open and manually reflash the SPI chip. We had to do this a lot. Yes. <laughs> Even when we were preparing our demos, like yesterday, I break the device. It's like and it's also very interesting because you bypass lots of uh, security features from the operating system. So all those UEFI bootkits on Windows and all those sort of things. And it's very difficult for you to detect. But, so just like uh, NSA, I'm also really good at like breaking routers. So there's this uh, document from on the Snowden documents. So that said, Snowden basically said that NSA tried to like reflash a firmware from like a Syrian router and it bro kind of broke the internet for the whole country for a couple of like hours. So it's a very sensitive operation. It's very easy for you to mess up. And it's not like if you create like a bootkit or a bootload, boot load, boot kit for one device, it doesn't mean it's gonna work for other devices, other similar devices. So it's very like particular to socks. It's very it's quite something like that you need to work a lot. And yeah. What about the journalists? So no. <laughs> no. So yeah, persistence can be gained in like various ways. One of them is um, by modifying the init or the init RD scripts. 
Uh, you can also make a loadable kernel module that loads like after the kernel loads the file system modules. You can modify UFI or BIOS code. You can also modify the code in the MBR and the VBR. And also, again, spoiler alert, boot kits, they are not new. So nowadays, there are like ransomwares, like targeting MBR. So they're just putting like something, some message there, and they will only unlock after you pay stuff. But so two interesting uh, boot kits here is like the old boot, Android boot kit. So some people said that was either like uh, compromising devices physically or some like firmware update. They don't know exactly, but it's a boot kit targeting Android devices. So if you just like uh, uh, refresh your firmware, it's also like not changing the bootloader partition. So it's something like very difficult for you to fix. And also the hacking team, uh, they, they had like a commercial UFI bootkit, uh, but they, they're more like an implant. So if some uh, mo some motherboards, like some notebooks, they had like they wouldn't protect that UF UF UEFI area. So sometimes you could exploit that to, to re rewrite that, but uh, most of the time it's by opening the phys the device physically and refreshing the SPI the the BIOS or the UEFI. So there's like no malware, and they just like infect your computer the normal way, just like uh, phishing, drive-by downloads, and they, they use a bootkit for maintaining persistence. So the bootkit we created, uh, it's uh, based on U-Boot, which is like a bootloader for embedded devices. It works for lots of ARM devices, also MIPS devices. It's open source, we will explain in a bit. But uh, in order for us to change the device, we don't need a physical access, we just need a root access on the device, and we, we're gonna explain how it works. So, Linux devices, they treat the, part, the flash partition as a memory technology device, MTD, and it's, it's not exactly like uh, char blocks or you know blocks block uh, file systems that you're used to on Linux. Uh, they are just like a raw flash memory, and you, you, there's not like a partition is not stored on the, like each partition before starting each partition. There's not like nothing like a partition table. So the kernel, it's listed on the kernel where the partition begins and where the partition ends. So on this case, uh, you can see like the U-boot partition, also like the, the actual firmware, like an ART uh, partition. And the bad thing for us when we were like started testing this, it's like the bootloader partition is always mounted as read-only, like not always, but most of the time. So if we get a root shell on the device, we need to DD our boot kit into the device, but that that like partition is read-only. So how can we do? How can we fix that? There's like this two uh, kernel module called MTDRW, so which is basically a Linux kernel module so I can just insmod, load that Linux kernel module, and that would change the partition flags from read only to read and write. So this is good for us because now, from a root shell, we can change that partition to something else. So it's, this is like uh, the code of the Linux kernel module, but it's just simply changing the flags. And this is really good because now we don't need a shell. We, we don't need a physical access, we just need the shell. And we can just like DD. And one thing that's important to mention, like if I have one, two similar devices, the bootloader, the U-boot U -boot partition is not gonna be exactly the same because there are like variable areas like uh, serial, like uh, MAC address, they're kind of different. So what we can do is, is just, we can just DD the, part, like the offsets rel related to the U-boot bootloader and we can just ignore the serial like, and just copy in that and just, you know, like skip it. So yeah, um, yeah, U-boot is an open source um, yeah, a bootloader. So you could just like download it from the internet. Uh, it's GPL source code, so GPL v2 license, which means that any vendor using U-boot has to provide you with the source code. So writing a bootkit like this becomes a lot easier than you know, writing a custom bootkit. And we used in this case U-boot mod, which was an uh, open source project from uh, Pepe2000, which is an uh, yeah, awesome programmer. So why U-boot, uh, there's this web, website called Wikidevi. It describes lots of information about routers, embedded devices, cameras, and all those stuff. So uh, U-Boot is the most used bootloader on the website. So the second most used is CFE, which stands for Common Firmware Environment. It's proprietary, it's from Broadcon. 
So it's also like open source, but it's not as easy to modify as U-Boot, and it's not as used as much as U-Boot, so that's why we chose it. So because we were planning on breaking the device like a lot, we had to make some preparations. We have a great guy in our team, his name is Frank, and he can solder everything, like literally everything. So we desoldered the SPI flash where the firmware and the bootloader is on, and he connected like the small pins that are connected to the SPI. He hooked them up to some wires, and then we used our, uh, yeah, the tool we use for flashing SPI chips, we just hooked it up directly. So when we wanted to boot the firmware, we just put it in the thing, and the moment we bricked it, we just put that thing in our hardware flasher and restored it back to how it was. Um, this saved us a lot of time. So U-Boot has some interesting functions. The one is printenv, it prints environment variables. It has TFTP boot, which allows you to boot images from TFTP. Uh, it has an env stop string, which uh, can be used to protect the, the bootloader menu from people who don't know the stop string. It's not a password, it's a stop string. And there's also a boot CMD, and the boot CMD is the command the bootloader will execute once the device has booted. Um, and ping is like ICMP ping, so you can see if hosts are alive and do some things on a network. So you can also have scripts, and the scripts look a lot like the bash scripting language. Here's like a dual boot example. We will ping a hard-coded server IP, which is in the environment variables, and then if it's alive, we do a TFTP boot to the load address of a backdoor image. And yeah, once it's done, we will yeah, boot it, and otherwise we will boot the hard-coded address that is from the normal firmware. So yeah, the printm function prints environment variables, and the environment variables are all stored in a null byte separated list. So there's like two loops going over the null byte and reading the environment variables. And the function that prints the environment variables is inside the, yeah, the nvedit.c command. And we made some changes to it. We basically made two functions. Like one function is called get match, and the other one finds a variable. So we made a list also of null separated environment variables that we want to backdoor. And then the moment you want to print an environment variable, it like iterates through our list, and if it sees like, yeah, I'm not gonna print boot CMD, then it's just gonna print our own custom boot args or our own custom boot CMD. Uh, another interesting function is the boot CMD function. Like the first command executed by the bootloader is boot CMD. So once everything is initialized, it will just execute boot CMD and boots a specific memory address. And we overwrote that in source, as you can see here. It's usually an environment variable, but we decided to like, yeah, skip that part and just hard code it in the source. So it will always use this as a boot, boot CMD. Uh, now we have a demo where we are dual booting. Do I no. No, you can hold this. Let me see if this works. Oh, no, that didn't work. I just have a full screen link working. I hope it goes no, on this no. full screen. It goes on this one. So, yeah. Uh, display. So what we are gonna do now, we are gonna boot. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, there it is. Uh, is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's paid. So, Mike. Yeah, Mike. First, oh yeah. So now it's like not alive because this is our TFTP server. It's not on yet, so you can't reach our hard coded server IP. So the ping filled and it's now currently booting the normal firmware. It's interesting because this function we created, like we ping our server. If our server is not alive, we just boot the re regular firmware. So it's like a kill switch. So if our server is alive, we can do stuff. So this is like he's checking the version of the kernel, which yeah. is like the regular one. And now we enable the server. In a moment, we can ping the server. It means that the bootloader can ping the, the, the server. And it will start downloading the boot the, our customized kernel uh, from our server. You can do this in theory over the internet. We haven't tried that yet, but it should be possible. It's a GLI net. It's a very small, small router. It's on his backpack, so we can show you. Yeah, if you want to see it. <laughs> so now we booted our custom kernel, and it's a newer version. Uh, we're currently building a custom kernel, but it's a little bit more tricky than we, we thought it would be. So we're actually, we're back, we're downloading, we're using TFTP to get a modified a kernel, but like the actual file system is the same. Because uh, we can just say like, yeah, the kernel is this one, different one, but like you do everything else just like you do le regularly. Yeah, so we can load a custom kernel and the custom kernel can make changes to the file system which is later mounted by the regular one. So yeah, we can put like Linux kernel modules, put a CPIO and like you just like extract and load that before mounting everything. So yeah, it's a different kernel, so we can do everything we want. 
exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and by, by having control of the kernel, we can load the existing file system and make changes to the normal file system. So we can be persistent yeah, on a, on a new next level. So yeah, U-boot has a password protection. When you will Google a U-boot password, the first thing that will come up is the env stop string we're using here. It is not a password protection and it should not be used as a password protection. Because you can just download the firmware, run strings on it, and you'll see the password. So never use it as a password. Uh, it's Lots easy. of vendors use it as a password. Yeah. And you can also really easily bypass by glitching, which we are going to show you right now, if I can get my mouse on the other screen. <laughs> so there we go. Yeah, so what we're doing now, we're pressing, oh, we're gonna wipe the device first. Uh, so what we did is we, uh, we created the stop string, but we made some changes to the code that where if you press an incorrect key or you, press an, you try an incorrect password, it will wipe the device. So you cannot use the device. So if you have like an incident response team that wants to take a look at our malware, yeah, we don't want that. So, let me see. This really sucks. I want to do this. Do it here. Yeah, the mouse is here. Yeah, I know. I know. So, play this. It's the next video. Yeah. So, yeah. So, now we're going to wipe the device. First, we're booting it in a regular way. And then we will reboot it and press the invalid key. It's also important to mention that like, uh, you only see all those information if you're connected to a serial. Uh, if you're using like a serial connector USB. So now we're rebooting, we're trying to press the key and it says nah, and then wipe the device. So, and we can just like DD, we can just like put zeros and we can do everything. So U-boot has a native erase command we can use, but we can also write zeros, use like write memory to the actual partition. And we can even uh, write to the variables that uh, are, you know, the clock speed. So we could even overclock the device and fry the device. So you can never use it. <laughs> it's really great. So we hide from strings because I play some CTFs where you just run strings and you see the, the secret token. So we use a little trick and the trick is to uh, make a byte array. And then we use string copy to copy the byte array into the string. And then when you run strings on it, you won't see anything. And when you put it in a, this is like an x86 example of what's going to happen. It's gonna move the individual bytes into a string and then compares the string. So you need to look a bit harder into the source code. But you can easily bypass this which we are gonna show you now. I'm gonna put the video here again. Yeah. So we had, we had some wires that are, were connected to the data out pin. Um, so we load the bootloader into memory, and then the moment you wanna load the kernel, you just short the data out pin, and then it will fall back to the bootloader. So you have access to the bootloader. That's what we're gonna do right now. And there you go, bypass the password protection. It's, it's really easy. So what can you as a defender do to like detect boot kits or to do stuff? So you boot there has this thing called uh, reproducible builds, which means that I can compile you boot and I can uh, hard code a timestamp. And if like I compile it today and someone compiles tomorrow, uh, or if someone compiles using a different system, it's all like the data partition, the code partition is always going to have the same hash. So there's like this uh, source date epoch variable. So you, you can already do that. So for example, Debian is using reproducible builds for the all the package, their DPKG. So you can also you can actually check if the source code and everything is the actual one you downloaded. So it's something really useful. So Debian was backdoored by the CIA once, and they were entirely compromised, and then they started to to really pay attention to reproducible builds. So there's also this uh, project from Intel, I think, called Chipsack, and which is basically a framework where you can use to uh, parse, read the content from like. BIOS, uh, UEFI, it's not more, it's not very focused on like U-boot and all those stuff, but yeah, we can always like write patches or, you know, submits and pull requests and do stuff. And there's also this really interesting project called non-UEFI 
executables. So it's also from Intel, which is just like a, rep a GitHub repository with uh, no UEFI images. With, and so you can just like hashes from all different vendors. So it's just like a big repository. So you can just query and look up and to make sure like you're running uh, an actual uh, like valid or known uh, firmware or if it's someone tempered or modified. And this is like the output from Shipsack. So you can, for example, run it on a MacBook and check if someone uh, tempered with the BIOS or if someone like disabled the, re the write, read write flag, you know, so it's not read only anymore. So you can do lots of stuff. So basically, Chipsack strips away the variables that are custom to your device and just looks at the code that the devices have in common. So when you place a backdoor, one of the common code segments would be different and Chipsack would detect that. So there's this presentation from the Google security team. So very few companies nowadays, they're good enough to find, you know, uh, imp hardware implants or modifications inside their, their firmware. So Google, uh, the, I think it was during RuxCon in Australia. So they, exp they explained uh, what are, uh, how they're like tackling, how they're dealing with that. And like they have this tool called Google Rapid Response. And they were explaining how they're integrating Chipsack to their like uh, incident response and like their agents. And also like it's why is it so difficult? So it's just like we explained it on the U-boot case. You have a code area and you have like a variable area. If I'm just comparing hashes, it's not gonna match. So I need to be able to parse that, unpack, and like for every different vendors or things like that. So trusted computing is something like very important. So there's like this tweet. So, uh, and Dino is basically saying like, if you UEFI secure boot suddenly uh, started booting unsigned images, how many companies, how many people would just like, f could find that? It's something very difficult. So inspectable systems, this is something like that we need nowadays. And this example here, so also leaked on the Snowden documents showing that NSA was basically intercepting packages. This is like a Cisco uh, device and reflashing the firmware with a backdoored firmware. And then, you know, as soon as it arrives on the guy, on the other side, it, they just have, they can collect data, they can like access that. So very few companies would know if they, the device that arrived there is the actual device that supports that the vendor sent it. So some companies are starting to uh, use secure boot. So there's this uh, company called OpenMesh. Uh, they, they also, their devices is just like uh, the device we showed here. It's quite similar. It's uh, an AP, uh, wireless repeaters and all those things. So they're using secure boot. So they're also using U-boot and they have uh, signed images. So the bootloader is signed using an RSA key. So the RSA, the problem here is that the RSA key is inside the same firmware uh, flash, flash, so the same blob. So you have like uh, all your data and you have somewhere there where it's, there's the signature. So if the signature doesn't match, if I'm trying to boot a modified bootloader, it would just don't boot. So what happens is G, uh, because you boot is GPL v2, some guys, they just asked the source code, they code reviewed, and they found out that uh, if you erase, so there is just like some a series of DD commands. So if you just erase the signature from the, the flash, it's not gonna check and it's gonna bypass it. So yes, uh, there's also a stack overflow on the U-boot uh, TFTP boot. So. On our case, we use TFTP boot to download an image from the internet, but there's also a stack overflow on that uh, component. So you could just like download a really big image, uh, like causing a, an overflow, and then you could just jump to the bootloader itself, then you could do whatever you want. Which is really hard and you probably need a JTAG debugger, but it's, yeah, something really cool. And it's a feature, not a bug, apparently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So bypassing secure boot, there's like some talks from Rescore guys. It's really interesting, like using glitching and all those stuff. So the we did like the poor man, poor man's glitching. It's just like a simple way, but you can always use like specialized hardware or th different things to bypass secure boot. There's also this uh, Aleph research. So it's really interesting. They have all kinds of bypass for mostly boot, mostly for mobile bootloaders like cell phones and all those things. And yes, the conclusion is that like secure boot is important. So we have to like start thinking about that. 
also for embedded devices, for small routers and those, those things. And we need to reduce firmware opacity, which means that transparency is important. So vendors nowadays, they worry too much about tamper proofing. So there's all like smart cards and all those stuff. They don't want you to tamper with that. But they don't offer any good way for you to know if the hardware that you got there is the actual like legit hardware. So uh, Intel ME, which if you guys like look about it, they had like this backdoor and it's very difficult for the operating, the, the actual CPU to know what, what it's doing or what it's doing not doing. And the so ME con controls parts of the CPU, so you could do basically anything. So it's really important that we develop tools and you know get hold of tools, create tools, and so we can have a look at our hardware and what runs on our hardware. Because if we don't know what's running on our hardware, how can we trust our software? Because the hardware eventually controls the system. And people, uh, older people here, I'm not sure if you had like all those old mod motherboards and there was like this jumper that you had to actually use uh, because it's a physical impediment. So y y the, the, BIOS, the BIOS is read only. If you remove it, then you can write it. So it's a simple thing. It's, so it's a physical impediment. So if you can have that, you have like a more secure. Suppose you need, you want to update your like ROM home router, you can just switch it or just remove a jumper. So it's simple things that people are not using anymore. So uh, also we need also better uh, documentation, reverse engineering scripts, and you know, and we need like better parsers for bootloaders. It's something that we need to understand so we can respond accordingly. And Any questions? Questions. <laughs> so, um, at the moment, we have several billion IoT devices in the world, and that number is forecasted to grow rapidly. So, the way that you're showing it in this presentation is uh, at least the 50% that you can access, there's really easy ways to get around everything. So, if the problem is only going to get bigger, uh, how are we going to scale our solutions to that? It's a really hard question. So yeah. It's my so, guy over here. <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, it's interesting for us to uh, show ways for you to attack devices, so people would start like better protecting them. So I think, for example, there's no like no no malware targeting boot kits nowadays. So I, I think why we found it's interesting for us to like give a talk about that. It's something like not that complex. But because it's so easy for you to hack an embedded device, like Mirai, Mirai doesn't care. So if the, it infects the device, it's gonna, if it, someone turn, turns off, it's within a couple of minutes, two minutes, four minutes, five minutes, it's gonna hack it again. So I think people should like start like showing proof of concepts, you know, and trying to, to reach, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, basically, so I, I, I think we should like have box proof of concepts, you know, so like ways for you to attack the device and so people can understand the threat. Yeah. Yes. So the device is well documented, it's open source. But for a lot of the, the first phase of uh, disassembling a device like this is like reconnaissance phase, right? Like, like right up in the kill chain. We're going to have a look at the chips that are on it. We're going to Google the chips. And the moment you find a data sheet, it explains everything to you. So, yeah, it's very easy for you. If you can just look the device, you can Google the, and find the data sheet. And it explains, like, this is the DI, this is the data in, this is data out, this is the ground. So you just connect it accordingly. And there's, like, flashers. There's, like, hardware flashers you can just plug, plug and, and dump. Or if you have, for example, a Raspberry Pi or a Big O Bone Black, for example, they have uh, all those connections for interfacing with SPI. So you just need to connect the correct wires and you can just reflash it. So the way we, we did, I think I can show them the device, but w what we did, we got the device, we desoldered the SPI flash and we connected those wires. Okay, so it's not here. Yeah, we can show you. But yeah, so we desoldered it. And yeah, and then it's very easy for us to use a hardware or just like Raspberry Pi or anything like that. And if the chip, you can't find anything on the chip, then you need to go with a logic analyzer or with the other thing. What's the thing called? CLI or? No, yeah, but, no, not a JTAG later, but then it's gonna be a lot harder. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> so you mentioned that you had some, you were looking for some ways to protect and check like the, the cache, etc. while you're coding. Uh, do you know what kind of algorithms are being used to get, you know, for instance, if you're looking and you have caches, we see that in theory, we can have some cache collision. So mm -hmm. do you know if there is something that we are looking forward to, to look into that? So uh, what happens is mostly most devices are going to use some kind of RSA signatures. So it's most of the time it's two two k two k so two thousand and forty eight bits. So which is like it's good enough. So you can just like hard code the public key. On our case, we just erase the public key, and only has the person who has the private key can sign a new bootloader, can sign a new firmware, and can like uh, update. The firmware. So, but what we need nowadays, we need also hardware protections like TPM, like in smart cards and all those platform modules. Yeah, trusted platform. So, uh, just by using uh, software-based solutions, it, it's you can always bypass. It's good, but not good it's good, but not good enough. So, and on x86 devices, we are very mature right now. So, like Microsoft, has support for TPM. Think of Linux nowadays that can do secure boot. So, every single part of the boot process is analyzed, hashed, and you can basically trust it. And on embedded devices, there's nothing yet. Mostly because they're cheap and people don't want to spend money on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Get your hardware from China, it's really good.